Please welcome to the stage, Starley Kine. I am writing a book about the self-help industry. Um, and I've been writing it for a while. And the original, uh, the point of the book is that I kind of go to different seminars and workshops and I try to have them fix very specific problems in my life, which are numerous. And actually they're getting more numerous like the longer I write the book to the point where the book itself has become my biggest problem and it's just <laughs> become this horrible albatross and I'm never going to get out or get fixed. Uh, and at, the longer I've written this book, the more self-help begins to kind of show itself everywhere. Like I never was into self-help before and then it just kind of started to pop out. And the boyfriend I was dating when I started writing this book turned out to be kind of a secret self-help junkie. Like I thought he was just like tall and skinny and had like shiny hair, but he was like a self-help fanatic. And he um, used to, when we woke up, he would, he, would, he would find a shaft of sunlight to sit in, like, and, like a cat, like he would kind of chase the sunlight and wherever it was, he would sit in it. And then I later read The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, and it tells you to find a shaft of sunlight and sit in it every day. So my boyfriend was like following Eckhart Tolle's weird sunlight advice and finding it. And then he ended up using The Power of Now to break up with me. <laughs> so like it had turned against me. And like when he broke up with me, I remember being like, but this morning we had such a good time and we ate breakfast and what about that? And he told me that I didn't live in the moment enough and I had to stop dwelling on the past. <laughs> and, and as ridiculous as I find that, there is a tendency I have to kind of, you know, um, in bad situations, like kind of, I'm not a positive person, I'm very negative, but I do tend to like hold on for dear life to any good moments and try to make them work. Not like, not in a positive way, but like in a backward survival way. And I told him, I've actually, I, it, I've actually never broken up with anyone myself. I always get dumped, like every single time. And when he was dumping me, I was just like crying and saying like, why do I always get left? Why am I the one who always gets left? And he just looked at me and was so confused and he was like, because you never leave first. <laughs> and this same boyfriend ended up, um, he told me before we broke up about this guy named Brad Blanton who made something called Radical Honesty that my boyfriend was really into. And there's books, and there's also like these seminars that you can go to that are eight days long. And the idea of, Brad said he's gonna cure us of like our addiction to lying. And I did like the idea of being radically honest because I kind of feel like I am radically honest, but to me I just thought it was always, I'm just inappropriate, like chronically inappropriate. And I just can't, tell, I can't lie even when it's going to save me, like I, even when it would do me good, like this same boyfriend, we broke up and like two months later, I saw him on the subway and he told, asked me how I was doing and I was like, I'm awful, you meant everything to me, I'm a wreck without you <laughs> and like obviously I was supposed to be like, I am doing awesome and <laughs> I have so many boyfriends now and I've never, who are you? I don't even know who you are, did we met? But instead I just like told him like, pathologically told him the truth. So then after we broke up, I was like, I should go to Radical Honesty and at the very least it would kind of be like a nice vacation where there's other inappropriate people and we're walking around and no one's rolling their eyes at me or sighing or getting mad at me or writing passive aggressive notes to me. And so I, I found Brad Blanton's email and I emailed him and I was like, can you squeeze me into your, you know, your September session? Is there any room for me? And he said, yes. He wrote me back from like Switzerland or something. And he was like, uh, yes. And I'll even give you a journalist discount. Uh, instead of $2,700, you can only have to pay $2,000. And I was like, score, awesome. 
I'm, and I booked a flight to Washington Dulles Airport where Brad's assistant, Jerry, picked me up with Brad's um, like number one fan, this woman named Anne, who had been 35 times to these seminars. And the two of them picked me up, and they like immediately just wanted to like ask me all these questions and be super starey and touchy-feely to me. And I have kind of this love-hate relationship to attention, like certain kind of attention, this kind of attention. I love, this is great, but I don't like it when it's one-on-one -on -one and someone's looking at me too much and wants to ask me lots of questions and I've just gotten off a plane and I want to just like stare out the window and not talk to anybody and they just had all these like questions for me and I just was very grumpy and then I thought they would kind of like that because I thought it was radically honest but they didn't like it and they didn't like me and they like, kind of formed a little clique with each other and like I was clearly like not very popular in that car and I was just very confused about what kind of radically honest I was supposed to be and then we were also driving forever like ever we just, just I couldn't believe how long we were in the car like the, like the radio station kept changing, kept getting staticky and going to a new thing. And we left, we ended up driving to Virginia, to this little town, Stanley, Virginia, population 1,379. And we pulled up to this driveway, and that's when I realized that Radical Honesty Headquarters, that I just paid $2,000 to attend, was actually Brad Blanton's house. Like his house, where he lives, and not... Like, my dentist works out of his house in Orange County, California, but it's like there's a dental chair and masks and, you know, fillings and stuff, and his, it's not like his TV and bed are not in there. Like, it's a separate part, but Radical Honesty was, like, in his house. Like, there was no separation. Like, the bathroom I used was Brad's bathroom, and there was, like, like dental floss and like rubber bands with like hair on them and grime in there and like I had to stay in his kids room and he was right down the hall and everyone else was kind of like sleeping on sleeping bags and it was like it was no order or structure and definitely no room service and I I my room at least had TV and I like immediately it was like an old TV and I like immediately found the channel that plays Law and Order all the time and just kind of put it on that and then I went downstairs, I was like, I guess I'll try to, I gotta, you know, go be radically honest. And I went downstairs and I met Brad, and he just was disgusting. Like, he was horrible, honestly, he was horrible. Like, if he was, like, a cartoon character version of himself, he'd be a toad. Like, absolutely. Like, his face was all, like, mouth was all wide, and he had no shirt on half the time, and he was barefoot, and he gave me a huge clammy hug, and he told me he was really happy to meet me, and he like led me into the living room and told me we should all get acquainted. And there were only seven other people in the living room, including Jerry and Anne, and every single person there had been to a Radical Honesty seminar before. I, it was just get acquainted with Starley. These people knew each other and like seemed to like live in Brad's house almost. One of them actually had like a tent in his yard. And so it was just like me there hanging out and we sat down and Brad was like, the first thing, the first rule of Radical Honesty is you have to like tell everyone who you really are. And so we had to go around and say, like, our name, our job, what we made, for, like, how much money we made, because he was all like, people hate talking about money. We had to do that. And then that crafty Brad always throwing the zingers at us. And then we had to say a secret. And so we slowly went around the room. And then the first guy was kind of this outsider therapist, and he said he hadn't paid taxes in 10 years. And then another guy said that he'd murdered a man, <laughs> like, like murdered, like really, like he had, was in a truck with this man and like punched him in the head and then threw him out the window and the guy was dead and then another car came and ran him over and then he didn't get, go to jail and he like never told anybody except for these people and was just like confessing to murder and then Brad was like, next, great. And then, <laughs> And so then, and he went to Anne, and Anne's the number one fan, and she was like, I don't know, my secrets are so boring. She's like, I guess I can talk again about having sex with my cat on a regular basis. <laughs> and I was just like, and honestly, I'm such, I know I'm not a very good journalist, because I didn't like do any follow-up questions. I didn't ask logistically how it was possible, and like who did what to who, and why you would do that and like whether there'd be like peanut butter involved or like I didn't ask anything 
and then <laughs> and then the man who the murderer like looked really put out that hit that she maybe was trumping his and he like raised his hand again and he was like also I've totally felt up my cat and like it, it was just like this crazy thing <laughs> And then it got to me and like the spotlight was on me and I was just like sitting there on the couch and I was like, well, I totally sometimes buy stuff that aren't on sale and I like shop too much and sometimes I'll be meeting someone for coffee and I'll say that the train broke down but actually it's because I went into a store and bought a dress. And they, there was like silence. <laughs> they were just like... And they just, like, who, I, I was uh, the freak, like, totally, it didn't matter what anyone else said, they were just like, who is this girl who's, like, not honest with her feelings, and also covering things up, and has all these boring problems, and Brad just looked at me, and he was like, Starly, what is wrong with you? And I was just like, there was not even anyone to, like, gesture to, like, no one, like, I, it didn't matter, the murder and the cat, they were just like, they were just like, he's like, what is wrong with you, Starly? And I was like... <laughs> nothing I'm fine and he was like I want you to sign he pulled out this contract and he's like Starly you clearly are too in your head like you think too much and he's like so in order to relieve you of that I need you to sign this contract that says you will do whatever I tell you for the next eight days and I was like no <laughs> I will not already I'm saying no and he was like and then he just like had the contract and he looked around the room and he couldn't believe me and then he just he just stared at me and was like fuck you bitch I resent you for defying me and again it was like this like I couldn't there was no one to like make connection like eye contact with I was looking and I was just like what are, did you just call me a bitch and he was like fuck you cut I resent you for getting mad at me for calling you a bitch and it was like this crazy thing <laughs> And then I was like, what are you talking about? And he told me he was at war with my mind. And I was like, I like my mind. And he's like, fuck you, bitch. I resent you for liking your mind. And it just turned into this crazy thing where he just kept telling me to fuck off. And I was just sitting there. And I really think it's because I had no one, because I had just heard about the cat and the murder and the cat again. And like, no one was active. And it's it like, within minutes, I totally turned into like a cult member. And I was just like, okay. And like, I thought I was crazy. And I started to cry. And then Brad Blanton started making fun of me when I cried. He literally was like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> look at the baby crying. Like, honestly, I'm not kidding. Like, he did that. And then I just, like, when he did that, I lost it, and I, like, ran upstairs to my room, and I was, like, throwing stuff into my bag and turning off the TV, and, like, I was, like, I have to get out of here, I have to get out of here. But then as soon as I did that, like, I picked up my bag and I zipped it up, and then, like, what ha the thing that happened to me was what always happens to me, like, in bad situations, right? I've been, like... I start to like falsely romanticize the situation and think that I have it all wrong and that it can't be as bad as I think it is. And I began to feel like nostalgic for the car ride with Anne and Jerry <laughs> and like attached and like strangely attached to like the bathroom and my new room and stuff. And then, and like I said, it's not like I'm not being positive. I'm just like, can't like I get so attached and I just begin to like doubt so much that I'm making the right decision and I don't want to live with that regret so I just just make really really bad choices in these situations so what happened was I just didn't leave like I unpacked my bag and I kind of sat down and was like it's not so bad here it's actually pretty great I totally want to be here I it's my fault like I shouldn't have not killed somebody <laughs> and set myself up for that kind of treatment and so I went downstairs and I, I apologized and Brad told me to fuck off for like eight more hours that night and then that was pretty much like how it went for the next five days like we would like get up we would do yoga we would break for lunch which was like these disgusting like cheddar cheese slices that everyone was touching and then Brad would tell me to fuck off for like the whole night and I don't even know what these people did before I got there because like the whole thing was about me like they weren't doing anything else except for like watching Brad tell me to fuck off and finally on the fifth day I went downstairs totally beaten down and Brad was like Starly I have a surprise for you and I was like oh good <laughs> I can't wait to hear and he said that 
um, normally at the end of radical honesty uh, sessions, everyone gets totally naked because they're so in love with each other and they have such a good time. And it's usually this big surprise at the end, but because they didn't trust me to be a member of the group, they were moving naked day up to that morning. And I had to decide whether I was going to like participate in Naked Day or not. And I was like, no, I am not going to get naked. And he was like, are you sure? It's awesome and fuck you, cunt, and fuck you, bitch. But also it's this great loving thing. And I was like, I'm not getting naked with you freaks. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. And I like turned around and went upstairs and packed my bag and made sure not to look at anything or think about anything. And I turned my mind off and I was like, I am leaving. And then once I decided to leave, I realized I had to get still figure out how to get out of there because I was two hours from civilization and it turned out it's very hard to flee a cult when you've decided to, when you don't have like a car, a rental car of your own. And so then I had to like actually logistically figure out how to leave and I like, the internet was all spotty but I ended up getting like some sort of, there was no cabs in the little town and I ended up getting like the city council on the phone and being like, um, do you guys have like a car service of some sort for me? And they're like, no, we don't know what you're talking about. Those words don't make any sense. And I was like, well, the thing is I'm in this guy's house and he wants me to get naked and I really just need a car now. And they were like, we'll see what we can do. And they like hung up and I ended up having to call a town like two hours away and being like, do you have any cabs that you can send to me? And they're like, yes but it'll cost $200. And I was like, it is very expensive to flee a cult, it turns out, <laughs> but I guess I will have to do this. And so I, I signed up for the $200 cab ride, and I waited, and I, had, I, I, I steeled myself, and I was not gonna back down. And then, like an hour later, one of the cult people called upstairs, and they're like, Starly, your, your ride is here. And I like ran downstairs with my bag, and it was actually the cops because the first person at the city council who I'd said I had to get naked had thought I was like a hostage in a house <laughs> and she had called the cops and the cops were like there outside, like these two cops and they had like their hand on the gun and they were all like, we don't worry miss, we've got you, it's okay. And they thought I was like Elizabeth Smart. They really thought they were like rescuing me. And I was like, no, he wants me to get naked. And they would like try to gum, they really wanted to arrest Brad, but I had to explain that it wasn't like a legal kind of naked. It was just gross, creepy kind of naked. And he wasn't actually breaking any laws. And they, they were like, they're like, don't worry, we'll take you. We're gonna take you to a woman's shelter. It's gonna be okay. And I was about to get in the car, but then the cab pulled up. And then I had to like make, and then it not only, so I went from having no rides to like too many rides. <laughs> I had to choose between the cops and this cab driver who was so sweet. And then I had to get in the cab because he'd driven so far and the cops really didn't want to leave me. Like they really, really, really wanted to arrest somebody there. And then, but I got into the cab and it was the cab's dr name, driver's name was James Taylor for some reason. And it wasn't, and then I was, and like we started driving away, and I started to suddenly notice that I, like it was really pretty there actually. Like I could see out the windows, and I hadn't even looked at the windows before, and I'd been so distracted by Jerry and Anne and ignoring them and avoiding them and where I was going. And it was actually this really, it was Virginia, and it was so nice. And I realized that it may, it was the first time I'd really like quit a situation that was bad for me. Like it was a cult and it may be obvious to a lot of people, but to me, <laughs> this was like a breakthrough and like a really big move. And I think the reason I was able to see everything that day was because I was finally living in the moment.